The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. I think uh, most of the people here in this uh, class. The presentations uh, in this hour are teams Kate, Don, and Chris. So team Don in particular, if you want to make sure you're queued up and ready to go, that would be great. Um, the presentations are uh, nine minutes in, in length. We will uh, have a hard stop at, at nine minutes. Um, I have some signs that uh, we'll show. And uh, why don't we uh, get to it? We have three presentations in this hour. We should introduce the uh, panelists uh, quickly um, as well. Um, Julie, do you want to start? And then maybe Rob as well. Do you want to do a quick introduction? That'd be good. Sure. Hi, I'm Julie Greenberg. Um, I work for uh, MIT through the Institute of Medical Engineering and Science and the Program in Health Sciences and Technology, and I'm excited to see these presentations. And I'm Rob Miller. I'm a professor of computer science here, and I'm one of the teachers. Okay, Tim Kate, take it away. Hello, everyone. We are Tim Kate. Uh, my name is Philip Abel, and with me here is Roquel, Jenny, and Drew. Um, today, we're going to talk about the project that we worked on all semester, um, particularly on the different prototypes that we created for um, different um, cochlear implant covers that we created over the course of this semester. Um, the design process that we went through, uh, the different experiments that we ran and the results we got, and what we learned from the process. So let's talk about our clients, Kate. Kate is, works at the Cambridge um, Disability Center, which means she's particularly concerned with ensuring that homeowners in the Cambridge area follow the guidelines that, uh, that ensure that people with special needs uh, can access buildings in the, in the Cambridge area specifically. So that's like, that's just an example of one of the things she does. And in addition to that, she has a profound hearing loss and wears cochlear implants. There are two main problems with this that Kate wants, um, at the beginning of the semester, two main problems that Kate wanted us to address was the issue, um, the issue that her cochlear implants weren't water resistant. And then in addition to that, the implants she wasn't able to properly distinguish between um, noise from behind her or when someone was speaking in front of her whenever she was in a noisy sentence. In a, in a noisy sentence, sorry. So it was this problem that we decided to tackle. And for this, we came up with a hat context, which was to create cochlear implant attachments that provide water resistance and then also enable sound blocking. So the idea of having water resistance was to have something that would help Kate be able to, you know, go out when, it, let's say in seasons when it rains more often, she would be able to go out and have, not have to worry about whether her implants are going to get wet or not. And then in addition to that, we decided, we also thought about making covers that would enable her to hear more clearly whenever she's in a noisy setting. In particular, she would, she would be able to distinguish between the sound that is coming in front of her from the one behind her. Then in addition to that, we didn't really tackle the problem of attachment, but it was just one main idea that we, we, try, uh, we tried to integrate into like all the different covers that we made to ensure that you know, um, whenever she attached it on her ear, it wouldn't fall off. So over the course of the semester, we brainstormed different um, prototypes. Um, start, at first, we, we began with this idea of creating one compact um, cover that would be able to, that would have all the functionality she wanted. For example, a cover that would be water resistant in addition to um, blocking sound. But when we spoke with Kate during the iterative design process, Kate told us she would want a more modular design. So we decided to go with a modular approach. So the quote, we'll take it off. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about um, the process of creating our prototype. So. Here you see kind of our version one of our prototypes. What we used originally was just plain Instamorph, which is um, plastic pellets that you can melt down and form into a solid plastic. 
So if you see in the top left here, those were our just original ideas for the rain cover. So something to cover the ear piece of the cochlear implant, and then something to cover the coil piece, which is the flat disc-like piece. Um, and then on the right here were our ideas for the sound blocking um, attachments. So we had this idea to just slip something onto the implant itself. If you look in the picture above, the microphone is actually um, located right on the very top of that curve. So that's why we're creating these pieces to basically fit right there on the top where the microphone is located. Um, we also did a, dabbled a little bit in trying to create some things out of silicone and clear resin and didn't have much success on that, but it was part of the process. Um, so these are our V2 prototypes. So we started to try and think about how we can make these more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, we tried to start incorporating color into the Instamorph, um, incorporating a little hood for the cord that comes out of the I implant, um, and also incorporating uh, a back layer to the, c the rain cover. So here you see kind of like a plastic sheet to provide uh, water resistance on the back side of the cover as well. And then here's a version of the, the next version of the sound blocking prototype, which we made out of Sugru, which we found we could just make look a lot nicer and smoother than with the Instamorph. Um, okay, so then on to our final prototypes, kind of the next round. So on the left is a, a new version of the sound blocking with Sugru, but with a lot less Sugru, so it's a lot less heavier. Um, and then we incorporated Dysum, which is a material that provides grip. So now, because we were having an issue with it falling off the implant. Um, the middle part is the coil cover, so we did use, end up using Instamorph, uh, black Instamorph with a back cover, I'll just say really quickly, uh, and then a vinyl cover for the water cover. Uh, final prototypes too, so we are moving forward with the ear cover with 3D printing, so these are our first uh, prints of that, and we're working with Danger Awesome to uh, make these look a little nicer and continue on with that. So um, in order to determine the usefulness of a prototype, uh, we perform uh, two sets of experiments. So one is the sound blocking experiment, and the other was the water resistance test. So in the sound blocking experiment, uh, we actually divided into two parts. So one was the quantitative estimation, where we wanted to quantify how well the cochlear, how well our cover actually blocked sound from behind and enhanced sound from front. The other was the qualitative analysis, and with uh, we wanted to value if the cover actually caused increased comprehension for Kate or not. And the other test was the water resistance test, and which the goal was to restrict the amount of water that goes into the implant. Uh, for the sound blocking experiment, we asked Kate to sit in the center of the pool of tables in one of the quiet classrooms of the Arrow Astro department. We placed the laptop at various angles across around Kate and placed sound at different frequencies and intensity. For each angle and for each frequency, we wanted to determine the minimal threshold at which Kate is able to hear the sound. Uh, this experiment was performed both with and without the cover. On the right, you can see the comparison of the result for both with and without the cover at a frequency of 1,000 hertz. As you can see, the listening of sound was enhanced in, in the field of view of Kate and was substantially reduced behind Kate. Um, for the water resistance testing, we did two tests. One was um, this water bead test where we put um, water on top of the cover uh, to just to measure whether the cover was actually waterproof or not. And we put um, a, the implant and then a paper towel and then um, the cover on top and let the water sit for both 10 seconds and then 10 minutes and then sh um, check to see if there was any wetness underneath that seeped onto the paper towel. Um, there ended up not um, being any wetness on the water bead test and for the water bead test and the rain test. Um, and the rain test was just another one where it is a little more realistic. We placed the implant um, on a vertical surface um, with the coil cover as well and then like splashed water on it as if it were raining. Um, uh, and we also found that there was no wetness either. 
So um, for the subjective results, this is, I guess, another term for Kate's feedback. And um, she provided very good feedback from the beginning. Um, she's really involved with our design process. And these are a couple quotes that we pulled um, from the most recent feedback she gave us on the sound blocking covers. Um, and we actually tested them out at a restaurant, I like using using them at a restaurant in a noisy environment, um, just to find a realistic setting, and found that the designs uh, worked well. Okay. So it's perfect because this is the last slide. Um, so a few things we learned: um, our project was kind of this assistive technology that we were augmenting onto Kate's assistive technology, her cochlear implants. And that was interesting for us to learn that, like, of course, assistive technology is supposed to help someone with their disability, but um, it's, of course, not perfect. And we had to kind of patch it to make it even better and more useful for Kate. Um, Throughout the design process, we found we explored a lot of options, and we felt that we could have gone through those processes faster, um, finding dead ends quicker, so that we could have moved on and created more prototypes and gone even further in our project. Great, thanks very much. We will get questions from the panelists uh, first. Rob, Julie. Sure, I can start. So, how many of these prototypes you showed a whole range of things? Um, uh, which of those actually made in the case years? Um, just step back. So, yeah. um, this prototype, the 3D printed piece, is something we're actually going to go with. And all of them, I guess, made it onto Kate's ears. Like, they actually wore them all at some point. But this is the final, final one. Um, and then the coil that you see in the middle, this one here is the, it's made out of Instamorph and we decided not to 3D print that um, because this was already a pretty, of pretty good quality or like of quality good enough that we wanted to use for our final prototype. So this is also going to be used as well. Could you go to the slide that shows the sound Yeah. And could you? Okay. Okay. So your results show that it was enhanced a little bit for sounds coming from the front, and there was mostly suppression for sounds coming from the rear. Yes. And, and that was all tested with the one thousand hertz tone. Yep. Or were there multiple frequencies? I think there were. There were, mul there were multiple frequencies at which we tested. Oh, so these are the results? So these are, yeah, these are the results that we got from that. Uh, sorry, I think Drew was the one in charge of the sound directionality test. So um, actually, um, it was tested at different frequencies, like uh, that's the nominal frequency for creating an audiogram, which is like a task from 250 hertz and goes up to 8 kilohertz. So, but the result that we have shown is just for like one frequency, which is like one kilohertz. But in the final report that we are submitting, we will mention about all the frequencies with all the tables and data and everything. So that to give an idea of how the that performed, we actually mentioned only one kind of frequency in the presentation. Okay, but thank you. Yeah. I, I wanted to understand <coughs> this, but now I want to ask the attention. So at, at the beginning, you mentioned um, <coughs> that you were I, w I wanted to see if you could clarify both what the goals were in terms of was it about distinguishing sounds from the back or was it suppressing some and enhancing others? Um, uh, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, you haven't heard in last. I just, could you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. Was the goal of the design to help Kate distinguish where the sound is coming from mm -hmm. or to help her hear some sounds and not others depending on the direction? Uh, I would say uh, no to both. It was more about you know blocking sound from behind and you know, enhancing sound from front, so that you know it's, it's about channelizing the three D space around gate, so that they could block the background noise and actually enhance the sound that is coming from the front. In the front. Okay, so you were using direction to define what was desirable and what was undesirable. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, it was not very well defined. 
but yeah i mean you could see the field of view that we have created here from uh, from the adapter standard for the human point of view so it's about a 135 degree and we were able to argue that um, in the field of view that is about 135 degree for a nominal human vision we were able to enhance sound and from the behind that is outside the field of view we were able to reduce the sound so how did that goal then affect your design because the, the other thing that um, I was hoping you could clarify, I think this is for the question for the whole team, is um, the fact that at one point you said Kate wanted modular solutions, but you attempted to design something that would that would provide both the water resistance and the sound blocking in a single device. So how, how did that all fit together? Um. So r what you said is right. It, the, our first thought was let's make one large cover that can provide the rain protection and also some sound blocking. Um, but she wanted a more modular approach, I think, to because it's not always raining and you don't always need this large cover. So she wanted something smaller that she can just put on a little bit more discreetly, like if she's in a meeting, for example, and, and she's really more focused on the sound directionality or if she's out with her friends and she's really more focused on hearing what they're saying in a noisy environment. Um, so did you design two different things? I guess I'm still confused. So did we you design two different things and which one of that was the... Um, yeah, the so if you go... So we did design two different things. So one is a set of ring covers. So a cover for the ear processor, which is the curved part, and then a cover for the coil that you see on the right here. And then the left picture is the separate piece, which is the sound blocking piece. Great. I think in the interest of time, we have to move on. But uh, thank you, Team Kate. I think you've done great work sort of prototyping through, the, through, the, through the semester. All right, great. We're going to do Team Chris next. All right, thanks. If you can get set up, that'd be great. I'm Carolyn, and this is Phoebe, Dirk, and Arthi, and we are Team Chris. So some context on our client, um, his activities that he wants to do and his assistive technology is that Chris is an MBA student at Boston College, and he has a genetic condition called Mayoshi myopathy. Mayoshi myopathy is a late onset form of muscular dystrophy. So when Chris was about 22, he started to feel some weakness in his muscles, especially in his legs. And now he uses crutches and a scooter, depending upon the distance that he wants to go um, on campus and at home. Um, so because he uses these devices, he needs to know a little bit more about his surroundings before he leaves. He needs to know if his route is accessible and if his destination is going to be accessible for him. And right now he uses a few different things to help him with that. He uses Google Maps, he uses Yelp, and sometimes he even calls ahead to see what the features of the building are before he arrives. But what he really needs is something that's more centralized and more comprehensive so that he knows exactly what his route will look like and exactly what features are in the building before he leaves his house. So that's what we tried to do is create the central location for all of that data so that he has one place to go and he will know ahead of time if he's going to be able to use the building the way he wants to. So um, to do that, we made a website called Successful Maps and it, we based it on Boston College um, first to scope it down a bit. Um, our first step was to make paper prototypes. So each uh, team member made pretty much drawings of what we thought the website should look like. Um, this consisted of either like text um, or just image based. And we presented this to Chris and he picked his favorite features out of each of them. And we used that feedback to create our second paper prototype. Um, and here, his feedback was that he liked the map interface and he liked how we had um, pop-ups for obstacles such as potholes, um, as well as a bigger pop-up on top of each building's floor plans. And in there, flags of um, obstacles inside the building and pictures of different rooms. Feedback on this prototype included a, a clearer distinction between the floor plan and the text, text description we had um, of each f um, floor, uh, as well as a summary page for every building. That's a general overview of different entrances and exits for every building. Our um, next prototype, or sets of prototypes, are the software prototypes, which um, included our backend uh, model of the data, such as um, buildings and flags and floor plans, as well as the uh, front end of how the website would look and feel for our client. Um, the 
feedback for this was that um, Chris liked it and he wanted to see a couple more icons such as an elevator icon um, as well as timestamps for every flag obstacle um, or obstacle flag or um, things that pop up so that he can keep track of what is actually recent and um, relevant. As far as our success metrics go, we had three main criteria we were looking at, one of which is the number of clicks it takes to access the information, second of which is how long it actually takes to get the information Chris is interested in, and finally, the amount of uncertainty that he's left with after using the application to get all of the information. Uh, to address this, um, we tried to design that all into our app, uh, so I can give a quick demonstration right now. So we created it, let's see. So our app ended up, sorry about that. Sorry, just a second here and I'll pull it up to show you exactly what we did. Um, it is a, there we go. So we, <laughs> sorry about that. So we have two different methods in which we went about um, presenting the information that Chris is interested in. The first of which is we have various flags um, that uh, call out for different information. So for example, accessible entrances, you can click on the flag and it tells you that, say this is the only accessible door to Stokes Hall and that specific information about um, that location. As it's overlaid on the Google Maps, you can see what it actually looks like. Um, we also have things like alerts um, at various other locations that can call attention to other types of, of information that might not be um, seen in, in other manners. Finally, on buildings, you can click on the building itself and view the information about the building and its floor plans. So you can click on an individual floor and see the floor plan and pieces of information about that floor, such as locations of accessible bathrooms or where the elevators are located. Now, Chris um, stated that as far as our, our metrics go, we succeeded on the metric of the number of clicks as it takes less than three to get to our, um, the desired information about the buildings. And as far as the actual time that it takes to accomplish it. Uh, Chris said using previous methods, he would take up to 20 minutes to figure out a route from building to building. And with our app, he believes he can do it in five to 10 minutes. So a 50 to 75% reduction there, which was we we're pretty happy about. And then he found it very easy to utilize and was able to find the relevant information very quickly. Um, they, he gave us a couple more pieces of feedback which we are um, going to continue to incorporate in such as adding um, the labels onto the buildings uh, to say what their names are and some images actually into the flags and the alerts to show more specific information. So a few of the lessons that we learned throughout the semester while working on this project were, so specifically for Chris, we learned that um, for his specific problem, we learned that things that are labeled as accessible don't necessarily mean they're accessible to him. So in general, what he wanted us to do for the semester was gather the specific facts that he can use and figure out for himself if the facility is accessible for him. Because um, he didn't want to trust other people's opinions because it's not necessarily true for him specifically. And so other lessons we learned, um, which were overall assistive technology specific or just design specific, were that you really need to get to know your client really well. So you have to get to know their needs, their specific wants, um, and don't go in with assumptions. So we went in with a few, but like they were knocked down like once we just had conversations with him. Um, and also, in general, universal design is really difficult, and you have to think really hard about it. So the product that we made is specific for Chris, but if we want to make it accessible to di people with different types of disabilities, there's a lot, of more, a lot more work that we have to put into it. Overall, engineering 
uh, lessons that we learned were one, to continue to use the iterative design process. And for our team specifically, a huge lesson we learned was throughout the semester we separated tasks and we were very modular with it. So we separated front end from back end entirely. Um, but when we wanted to put them together a few weeks ago, it became really difficult because the front end people didn't know what was happening in back end, back end didn't know front end. And so we learned that we have to continue throughout the semester to at least like update each other on what's going on so that we know in general what's happening in the whole scope of things. And so that's what we learned this semester and thank you. Any questions? Thanks very much. <coughs> we'll go to the panelists. Um, you said that Chris thought that he could be able to do like four times better, four times faster. Did you actually have to that? Did you have to find it? Yeah, so, so the, um, the reason that I said that is that we did model after the Boston College campus, um, which he is already familiar with. Um, so he, he did actually go through the process of looking up the information. But I mean, he, so the, I said like he thought that he could do it in that time because that's what it, it took him to look it up. Even though he's already familiar with it, it's not really an unfamiliar place. Um, we chose to focus on Boston College because that was, um, it was more directly, we, we had the information and we could see exactly, get a better idea of what it was that he wanted because he had sort of seen all of the bad parts and know, knew what information he wished he would have known at that point. Julie, question? Okay. Um, I have a question just on the uh, on the data side of things. Uh, the data that you used to populate your map, did you sort of hand collect that? And are there certain sources of data that might be useful for the rest of campus or for other uh, like sort of structured data stored uh, sets that might be useful for um, a project like yours? So uh, right now, we put in all of the data that we're using. But one thing I didn't actually show is that users can input new information into the app. So they're able to add new flags very easily, as well as new buildings, new floors onto buildings, and update that with information. So right now, it is fully dependent upon users to input the information. But any user can put that information into the database. Other questions from mentors or from students in the class? Anyone? OK, I think, I think your team has really uh, done some uh, interesting work on, some very good work on this campus accessibility question or this environmental accessibility question. So uh, well done. Great. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian, and this is Christina. And our third member, Jan, is not here today. But our team is Team Dawn, and we created an app called Your Friendly Reminder. Your Friendly Reminder is a reminder system that will send daily emails to our client, Don, and allow him to see his list of calendar events in the early afternoon where he typically tends to have a cognitive deficit. So first we'll go through the background of our client and then let you little in a little bit about our design process and how we kind of came to this design. And then we'll go through our, our final prototype and along with our testing and our reflections. Uh, so a little bit of background about Don. Um, he lives independently, and he is, but he's actually very active, and uh, he's an advocate for people with disabilities, so he goes out to meetings all the time to speak at them. And um, he, when, during his childhood, he contracted polio, which affected his left leg. And back in 2002, he had a stroke, and this limited the use of the left side of his body, and also, um, as, an, as a result, he has cognitive difficulties, which is what we focused on uh, for our project during this semester. So uh, about his cognitive difficulties, um, around 2 p.m. every day on a typical day, uh, he would start to have uh, trouble processing his thoughts. And this is, uh, and it affects how he can communicate with people. So. Um, one of the things that we wanted to focus on was to, since he's a very busy person, uh, was to uh, help him remind, be reminded of and encouraged to complete like his tasks that he has scheduled throughout the day, and also to ensure that he acknowledges uh, the reminders rather than ignoring them. 
So some of the assistive technologies that he currently uses, um, he uses a leg brace to make sure that he doesn't hyperextend his knee. He also uses a cane to help him walk. Um, he has Velcro on his shoes, but one of the most important pieces of technology that he relies on is his iPhone. And so uh, he pretty much stores everything uh, on his iPhone, like everything about his day, and he keeps notes on his iPhone. And currently uh, he has he enters all the events uh, for his day into his Yahoo calendar, which then is imported into his iCal, and then he accesses his events from there. And from then, he gets reminders about like when his events are and what they are. So from this, uh, we wanted to create a reminder system that would not only remind him of his upcoming tasks for the day, but also encourage him to stay focused. Uh, while he's experiencing cognitive overload. And uh, the goals of our project was to make uh, the reminders more gentle and humane so that he would be encouraged to actually look at them. And reminders that would help him internalize uh, the, what the um, upcoming tax, tasks are rather than just dimis dismissing them as he does now. And uh, we also wanted to make sure that his calendar could be backed up because that's something that is very important to him. So for our first uh, prototype, um, we actually thought of making a app. And so we had him test out a paper prototype of this app where he could enter in his events and um, it would create a reminder for him. And we were thinking about ways to make this more of a uh, more of an interaction where it would, rather than stressing him out with like, oh, you have all these events for the rest of the day, it would help him to calm down and focus. And so one thing we figured out about this design is that we're basically just creating a new application that already does what iCal does. And so we went to our second design where we, where we use Google scripts to import his events from Google Calendar and use that information to be able to reformat it and send him an email that will show him the, his list of events. So you can see here in our second iteration that we were able to grab his calendar events, but it's just kind of a, it's just in a list form. So he has PPAT, adapt, reminder, et cetera. And these, and these events, these calendar events would be listed in a in a single list so that Don could simply look at this email in the afternoon and be like, oh, okay, I have all these events and this is just one more thing that will help me make sure I complete everything successfully and attend all of the events that I need to. And so we moved from this to our third iteration where we were able to focus on what it would look like in his phone. And so we wanted our reminders to be more gentle and more humane rather than a little pop-up from I, from Apple saying, or Siri saying, reminder you have X event, snooze or okay, or dismiss. And so with this, with this Google script, we were able to send him a cute little email that not only would that not only had a, an image of a cute puppy or a kitten or something like that but also had had colors and it was personalized and we found out later that Don really liked the idea of having a personalized email just for him and so this email we called it your friendly reminder and we were able to and we were able to use all the information that he already has but be able to use it in a way where he he looks at it and he feels good and so one of the problems that we ran into is that we really wanted a response system. And so we wanted to send him an email. We wanted him to be able to look at this email. But how are we going to check to see if we could do that? There, it was, we didn't really want to hack into his email and check what time he read it. And so the way that we decided to implement this was to have a response system. So he would, he would simply respond muffins or whatever keyword we had. And so you can see right here, there's a little there's a little text and it'll be bigger in a second. Um, to, stop these, to stop these reminders, reply to this email with the word muffins. And so he would reply to this email with the word muffins and then we would send him another follow-up email saying, thanks for your reply, we got your message. And so one thing we found is that he didn't like the continuous spamming of the emails, which I'm sure we can all understand, all relate to. And um, so we worked through that, which I'll t tell you a little bit about in a second. And so 
Our final prototype removes these constant reminders. And so there's just one email that we'll send to him within an hour if he hasn't responded. And then we want to still be able to have this reply mechanism so that he's so that we can still make sure that he reads the email. Because as annoying as it is to keep on receiving emails, we want him to look at this email and we want it to be effective. So here's an example of what a sequence would look like. So you'd send him an email in the early afternoon. So this one was sent around 2.26 p.m. And so you can see his events for today and we changed the keyword to brownie. And then there's another cute kitty picture. And so we, in our back end, we have a rotation of these. And so you can see that Don checks his email quite frequently and he responded within one minute responding the word brownie. And so we, in response, sent him one last email saying, got your message, thanks for replying, and have a great day. And so this is what our final prototype looks like. And so when we tested it on him, like I said, we first tested it with trying to find a balance between sending him too many emails, but ensuring that he checks our email and doesn't dismiss it like his other reminders. And so he found them to be kind of annoying. He might have even said, quote, I find it harassing. So we tried to limit that to two emails because we still wanted to see how many, what was the threshold of emails we could send before he really got so annoyed at us that he would chunk his th phone at, at the door. And so he, he still found them annoying, but then we tried testing him with zero follow-up emails, and we found that he still liked the idea of having to respond and having someone, aka your friendly reminder, follow up on him within an hour to make sure that he checked. And so in, in conclusion, we've also learned that it's challenging to evaluate a system like this. How do we, how do we use our success metrics, and how do we use data points such as the time we send emails, the time he responds to emails, and how do we make sure that this product is effective for him? And so we found that that was really difficult to do, but I think we were able to because one of the things he said was, it's one more step that leads me to the end. It might be one, it might be one more thing that will ultimately lead me to the end of the day where I've completed all my tasks. Even though I do have it in my calendar, I can look at it myself, but one more email helps me. And so... Um, a little aside, after the 10th time, the puppy gets old. So we started switching the pictures to different um, kittens and frogs and m little puppies. So um, our final prototype was something that we believe will really help him and that we believe will really allow him to have more gentle, humane reminders that will ultimately help him with his cogn cognitive deficit in the early afternoon. And the next steps, we're looking for a workaround. And, um, and we've already talked about this. So I will ask for questions. Thank you. Questions from the panel? Julie Roberts. So I think you're right. It's, um, it is challenging to evaluate a system like this. But if you had a lot more time and resources, what would a more rigorous evaluation look like? So currently, we we have a Google Doc in the back end where all of the data that he, all of the data that we have, including what time the emails are sent out, what time he responds to them, and what time our system is responding to him. We have a few data points, but it's only about three days worth since we've implemented this Google Doc. But we've been testing this for probably about a week and a half to two weeks, and each probably couple of days we'll get some sort of reminder. We'll get. Um, will get improvements that we will implement. Does that answer your question? For example, the sending him two emails, two follow-up emails rather than four. Um, do you know if this is having any effect about that? I love the way you, uh, you expressed one of your goals as getting him to internalize the goal of not just uh, look at it and just think about it. Um, do you have any data about whether it's we do not one of the things we really wanted to was to find how many times he comes back to this email because what we would like for him to do is at 5 p.m be like oh what do i have going on today let me go back to this email that your friendly reminder has sent him um, so no we do not have that data the only thing we have is just his personal um i guess feelings about it whether he feels like it helps him and which he says that it has. And so we're hoping that at this point, it's enough for us to 
feel like we've done something. Uh, the follow-up question actually also about internalization. So this keyword idea for replying rather than just having a simpler way to do it, I just have a button there that we go to the right. um, and runs the script and checks it off. Uh, but the keyword is interesting because it seems like there's a possibility that you can help him internalize it by making the keyword relevant to what he's supposed to do, you know, um, instead of just muffins, unless he actually is supposed to make some muffins. <laughs> The keywords are currently just randomized. We were thinking of doing something along the lines of reading through his events and then picking out a word from that event and then making that the keyword. Yeah. And that's something we did debate the debate, but we never really implemented that because we wanted to add the other features. But that is something that we have thought and is a good idea and then we could implement. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I'm wondering, have you thought of using this application for persons with other types of disabilities, like this, such as psychiatric or having aphasia? Well, right now, a lot of stuff is hard coded, so we can't really extend this to more than one user. And that's something that we do want to try to expand, but Apparently, I, I tried to look all over Google, and they don't save your first name for some reason. So even your first name is hard coded, and that's something that we would need to step away from in order to expand this to other users. But that's something that we would really like to do. I think cognitive overload is something hard to empathize with sometimes. What were your experiences trying to empathize with Don during this entire semester? So I think the biggest one that did affect us was trying to get conversations steered in a direction, it's understandable that you have a lot of stuff going in your mind and just simply keeping a conversation going in one way did prove to be a little bit uh, tougher than we expected, but that is in, in part of the cognitive overload to have one goal in mind. And it, it was hard to empathize with that, with that with, at the beginning, but the more we did uh, interact with Don, we understood that this is an issue and it's not his or our fault. And we understood that we needed something to make this better for him. Maybe related to that, can you talk a little bit about the design process? Does that mean that sometimes you have to kind of push or nudge ideas um, in a certain direction? Um, you know, how do you sort of navigate kind of this user-centered or user uh, input in this process? Yeah, so just getting ideas at the beginning of the project was a uh, a little bit tricky, especially if you guys didn't know, we actually started off with a different project for most of the semester, and then we decided to switch gears and go something more software oriented. And that was definitely a tough process to go through, but once we got something going, it was a lot easier to streamline the process. Okay. Uh, I know that your team has uh, you know, had quite a ride this semester, uh, and, uh, but I think. Uh, has come up with something uh, very promising with some interesting results. So, well done. Great. All right. Hi, guys. We're Team Jeffrey. And then we're here to present our product, which is called Touch and Sign. Which Jeffrey named. Yeah. So let's give a little <laughs> overview first. Um, so our client is Jeffrey. He's sitting right over there. Um, so his disability is that he's blind. Um, and generally, he lives with himself, but sometimes he has a seeing aid at his house, and he actually goes out quite frequently. Like sometimes he goes out to like the neighborhoods, but like every week or so, he will sometimes go out to like further places, like to watch a movie or like to catch an opera. Um, <coughs> and he's also a pretty active member of like a number of community organizations. And as such, like he's in charge of like financial matters as well as like other matters. And because of this, he like often needs to sign like legal documents or just like other important papers. All right. So the goal of our assistive, assistive technology for this semester is to have a way for him to sign these legal documents that he needs to sign without the aid uh, or without the help of his like seeing aid. And so like. Before, usually he just has his seeing aid come over, which and then he'll like manually guide Jeffrey's hand to like the place he needs to sign. But sometimes he can't always be at his house. So then we wanted to come up with a way to, for him to be able to like sign his signature on the paper, even when his seeing aid wasn't there. 
And sometimes like for certain organizations, they actually need his like actual written signature on the paper. So then like sometimes like we thought about maybe just like sort of somehow like printing it on there or like some other way of electronically putting it on there. But they need this thing called like a wet signature. So then this like was not always a possible solution. Um, so what Jeffrey has already is he has a software called JAWS, which is this really cool software for blind people on like the um, PC that essentially reads out what's on the computer. And it's like pretty intuitive and it's like very detailed in terms of like the things it can describe to you. He also has a, um, like an OCR software, an optical character recognition software, or like he has someone that can do it for him, in which he can like convert general documents into Word documents that like sort of has the same characters in the same places. Um, so what he needs is like sort of like in two steps. The first step is he needs some way like given a Word document to find like where he needs to sign on the Word document. So like if you're given an electronic Word document, he needs a way to like know on this document like where the signature is. And then after he has that, he needs to like from that information on the physical document, he needs to like be able to like locate that on the physical document. So then we've broken up into two steps. And then the first step is like a software step, and then the second step is a hardware step. Right. Yeah, so basically here's the software design. So the first design we have is to activate through a macro toolbar in the Microsoft Word. So you can see that whenever uh, we, tr we find the signature bar with, where we first scan the documents, and then uh, we locate, so like the JAWS will read like underscore, 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 so we know that it's a signature field. So then we trigger the macro we have, so it will read out like the horizontal position and also the vertical position. Basically give Jeffrey XY coordinates to work on at the mechanical software, uh, mechanical solution part. And uh, it also tells him like which page it's, it is on. And also, so like for the final design, we basically simplify this thing that Jeffrey needs to remember and also the action that he has to do. So like we active, activate the macro through like hotkeys, hot and also we have like more <coughs> intuitive wording, so, and also uh, we rounded the decimal places because it doesn't have to be too, like, too accurate. So the hardware design iteration one, so like the approach we have is that we do like fast prototyping, we have like multiple iterations. So this is the, like the, the very first design we have. So um, the feature it has is compute, like completely made by hardboard and also floss. And also um, along the board, you can see that there are dots along the edge to indicate the coordinates. So um, and the X, Y bar are tied on the floss to slide through. So the feedback we got is that it's not like accurate enough like for the rails for Jeffrey to uh, read the numbers. And also it har it's hard to put the paper on because the X, Y rails are tied onto the board. And also Jeffrey has to count the number of the bumps. So like if he like, um, be, if he's uh, interrupted, so he has to count again, so which is uh, not very convenient for him. And also the second design is that we improve it by using a magnetic bar instead of uh, using the bump that we manually made by the cardboard. So it's easy to slide, but then the, gar like the guided bar are still too thin to be accurately lined up so that it can be like very like horizontal and uh, vertical. And also the movement on the magne magnetic stripe is not like smooth enough because the cardboard is not even, like it's not even and also like hard to tell if the rails were straight. Okay. So um, this is like our third design. So we took Jeffy's advice and we made the board a lot bigger because he wanted to have shoulders so that if for example, like one of the rule, um, if he needed to sign like um, really close to the edge of the paper, we would be able to like move the rail to that. So. Um, for the third design, we wanted to do something different, and we, add, we added the Braille ruler onto like the horizontal guide bar so that um, after he finds the vertical position, he can simply like put his move his hand along the Braille ruler on the horizontal bar in order to um, figure out like the um, uh, the X part, the horizontal position of it. But um, the feedback that we got was that the thicker guide bars made it a lot more easy to line up because we had the Braille rulers on the sides so that um, if we had like a three, if the guide bars are like three inches wide, then he could like uh, line it up against the braille ruler and have it very like, and have it be like very straight. And that was like pretty accurate. But the problem was that like this design demanded too much of the user because if you had to use one hand to like move down the uh, bar and then uh, you had to use like the other hand to move along the horizontal position, it was very hard to keep track of like the horizontal position and sign at the same time. So uh, Jeffrey actually preferred like the previous design that we had um, over this one. So um, 
we don't have a picture here, but basically what we did for like the three third iteration prime is we took stuff from the uh, third design but instead of like having just one guide bar with a horizontal ruler attached to it we put the um, horizontal braille ruler onto the uh, onto the board and then we uh, we added onto it like another guide bar so he would be able to like move two guide bars and not have to like keep track of the position with his hand and then we still use the same uh, same base as uh, before so the feedback that we got was that a Again, like the thicker guide bars made it a lot more uh, accurate, and then uh, it was a lot more easy to use in the previous one. Okay, so uh, this is so we actually found online at this place called like Maxi A, like something that does like the same thing that we were trying to do. So um, we kind of we bought it and we tried to test it out. Uh, so it's like a commercial product built on a clipboard, and it has a ruler uh, that goes down, and then it has like a uh, a thing that like clicks if you move it across so you can find like the xy positions but uh the feedback was that like jeffrey really liked the idea of like holding stuff down with the clipboard because it makes it really stable um and he likes how like i guess like the stability of it but the problem was that um it was just not a very accurate solution because it wobbled around a lot um it could only click and the clicks were hard to count and uh, there was no place on the board for a braille ruler, so it was hard to find like the position. So um, our final prototype, we decided to kind of just make a higher fidelity version of um, the third design that we had. And instead of having um, instead of having tapered edges, we decided to go with just like non-tapered edges because that would make it easier. Uh, because we didn't really see the point of having tapered edges, and we made the whole board magnetic so that. Um, it'd be easier for the rails to uh, stick on and they wouldn't fall off. And it's very similar to uh, the third design. Okay, we're gonna watch a video of like, him using the software. So right now he's trying to find where the signature bar is. Yeah. This is his computer. All right, so, all right, so. Wow, that's super. Yeah. <laughs> Can you take 30 seconds and wrap up, please? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is him. And this like what the result was, uh, yeah. And then like we measured like a bunch of uh, I guess. We wanted to know like how accurate it was, how fast it took him to like use a mechanical prototype, and what he thought of like his overall satisfaction. And these are kind of like the summary of his results. Yeah. And then um, there are a lot of things that we learned through this. Yeah. So basically, the first thing we learned is that there could be a lot of more like a lot of challenges that we didn't like pre predict and also like but fast prototyping actually helps so that we can make more iterations and the second is that the details are the most important part while we are doing the design and the third is that we need to take into account the burdens that we have on the on our clients and also like the manual testing is very like important to find the flaws and the bugs and the fifth thing is that like nothing can be really perfect we have to make like trade-offs so like we have to choose what we value more and the last thing is that like, documentation is really important. It's easy to fall behind, so we, it's really hard to make it up. And that's a good ending. OK, thank you very much. Thanks. Let's start with questions from the panel. How many times did you test it? How did you determine how accurate was it? Was it like 
one time, like... Yeah, so we, like, tested it a few times for each, and then we essentially looked at, like... So, like, um, generally, like, the accuracy for how, like, wobbly it was was, like, not a problem. So it's essentially, like, where the signature line started versus, like, where he started, like, signing it. And then we just, like, took, like, the average of those. How did you find more challenging in this project, the software side of it or the uh, hardware side, the developing of the accurate measurements of that? <coughs> I think, like, personally, we found the hardware side a bit more challenging. I think we are more, like, towards the software side as, like, our, like, studies. So it was, like, more out of our comfort zone to do the hardware side. And part of it is also, like, iterating on hardware is, like, more of a time-intensive process. I think we had a hard time, like, trying to scope out our project. Like, do we want to handle, like, documents of all sizes? Or, like, uh, do we just want to do it for, like, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper? And um, I think we wanted to make the hardware solution, like, very elegant. So it took a lot of time to, like, figure out, like, how to make it so that it's easy to use and like suitable enough to understand. Yeah, and also like a lot of challenges that Jeffrey has using our product, we cannot see while we do the design. For example, he wants the entire like surface to be flat, and also he wants like uh, to be able to have a bump to align with the bar. So we kind of like don't know that when we are like be able to see everything, but like when he uses it with them, it's at that time we have realized. Okay, I think this team has uh, done some great iterations and, uh, and made good use of Jeffrey's ability, so well done. All right, thank you. All right, we'll get Team Felicity set up. Hello, everyone. Uh, so our product is VibeAware. Uh, my name is Ari, and these are my teammates, uh, Becca and Simi. And our client is Felicity. Felicity has neurofibromatosis, which has, as a result, left her uh, profoundly deaf and uh, with low vision. Um, however, Felicity is very active, and she tends to go out with friends. She has uh, doctor appointments, goes to cafes. And of all of these activities, she notices that it's really hard for other people to get her attention. So that's why we decided to create VibeAware. VibeAware is a device with two components. The first one, Felicity wears, and uh, the other one she gives to a friend. When the friend wants to notify Felicity and get her attention, they can just toggle the button on the remote, and then Felicity will get a vibration that'll let her be aware that someone's trying to notify her. Hence the terrible word, word pun. <laughs> um, and we're gonna talk about the design process. So, through our project, we used an iterative design process. Um, and our iterations went as follows. Uh, our first design was a toy car uh, spin-off. Our second design was a light ring. Then we created a custom circuit and finally refined that to our final design. And I'll go over those more specifically now. So in our first iteration, we asked ourselves the question, how do we get an RF signal to trigger a motor? We're all software um, focused in our studies, so we don't really know a lot about hardware. Um, but so we thought that the best way to do this is to use something that's already out there, and that is a toy car. A toy car has two switches that essentially trigger um, two different motors using an RF signal. So we took apart a toy car, and we learned a lot through this process. We learned about RF signals. We learned about how this works, what components are necessary to make it work. And um, through this design, we kind of played around to see what we could get, how big of a design we could get. Um, but our pros in this design were that we learned about RF signals. We found something that works at a long range. The cons were obviously that it's huge and bulky and it has a lot of pieces that we don't need and it's not customized. So we went into our next iteration and we asked ourselves the question, is it possible to create this with a smaller design? Uh, again, we went with something that's already out there. We went with this little tiny light switch that basically is remote controlled. And we kind of hacked that to create our own little VibeAware ring. So this essentially is a little light with a motor attached that we hacked on. And um, the remote control essentially turns on the motor um, as a notification. The pros of this design were that it was very light and small, 
but the cons were that it works at a very limited range, the battery was short-lived, and the circuit was just hacked. It wasn't customized to what we wanted it to do, but we got something to work. So now we're going to talk about iteration three, which basically progressed our design further by three steps. Um, we asked ourselves the question, can we get better range with a smaller device? And Ari's going to talk more about this. So the first thing we felt was that we weren't going to be able to reach our design objectives using off-the-shelf hardware, and we'd have to go and create our own circuit. So this is our uh, first end-to-end -end custom circuit product that we made. <laughs> uh, and I'll talk about what we did. So basically, we did a search on different hardware components that we'd like to use. We ended up getting a small cell phone vibration motor from SparkFun. And the uh, other component we had was the receiver and the key fob. So this was great. This had a, a remote control that was already made and a corresponding chip that we just had to supply power to. Uh, you didn't need any other microcontrollers or extra stuff. And when you hit the remote, it would uh, set one of the pins to high on this uh, transmitter uh, receiver device. It had up to 25 feet of range, uh, depending on line of sight obstructions, and it was only $12. So using that and other basic components like LEDs, push buttons, um, we were able to create this uh, design. So we started with the schematic, and we had different uh, pretty much the easiest way you could try to set this thing up. We tested it out on a breadboard, and then we tried to put it all into a small um, proto board, and afterwards we put in a cardboard box. Uh, <laughs> so surprisingly, this was, uh, Felicity was really excited when she received this, and, uh, but we felt that we could probably do a little bit better. Um, so the pros of it was it was our fully functional circuit design. It had longer range than the ring, and it was much smaller than our RC car. Uh, the con was we really didn't spend time thinking about the enclosure. Uh, this one also had a very large battery pack, and again, the circuit wasn't completely closed, so it was a little bit fragile. So um, after this, we said, how can we improve this? How can we make it more durable? So I'm Becca, and I'll talk about this final design that we put together. So the goal of the final design was to make something that was mo a bit more durable and compact. And so what we decided to do was create an acrylic shell for a final circuit. And we also wanted to think about how we can make the vibration a little bit more strong. And so we decided to go with a 9-volt battery instead of the smaller batteries that we were using before. And in this final design, we considered both maintainability and also usability. Because we were using this 9-volt battery, we had to make some minor circuit adjustions. So uh, since the receiver uses 5-volt, we had to use a linear voltage regulator to just interface the two components. And so we edited that. And also in this final design, we had to consider how Felicity was going to be using it. And so how these various components, like the motor, the switches, the LED, and the battery, were going to be positioned in the final design. So I'll talk a bit about this later. But these are just sketches of us brainstorming as we were thinking about it. And also as we were thinking about this, we decided to make the final design a necklace instead, because at one point in our interview, Felicity had mentioned that her sternum area is one of her most sensitive areas. And so if we could leverage that and put a motor next to that, we thought that the notification would be more effective. And so when we were making the acrylic shelling, we first designed it um, in the software and then just use a laser, cut, laser cutter to create the acrylic shelling, and that's what you can see here. And this was the size we had to make in order for the battery and the circuit to fit inside of it. And so this is our final design. It's actually a shiny black encasing, but we had to tape it when we were first testing it out. But as you can see, first the antenna has to pop out because we want to maximize the signal strength. And we put the LED at the top of the necklace device so that it maximizes the visibility when she sees it. And and we have two switches. So one switch is she flips it on when she first wants to use the device, and then the LED will turn on then so she knows it's on. Then when her friend triggers the device and it starts vibrating, she can press a second switch, which is a push button, to reset the device and turn off the vibration. But the device will keep on listening until she switches off the LED. 
And so when we were put as positioning the switches, we knew that Felicity was right-handed, and so we put the switches accordingly. And we also put the motor on the back side of the necklace so it was touching her skin. So some pros of this are it's more robust, um, and we thought about the positioning a bit more. But inside, the circuit is a bit messy, and the battery is really heavy. So the reason why we decided to go with the 9-volt battery was because we wanted to make sure she can still replace it once we've given this to her a little while like later. Because we were really tempted to use a smaller battery, but it'd be a lot harder for her to replace. And we really wanted to think about maintainability. Um, so we're running out of time, but I guess... We also considered distance and vibration, um, and she approved of the vibration <laughs> strength, and with the distance, we ended up with 25 feet range, which was good for the use cases that we were considering. And just wrapping up and talking about some learning and reflection that we had with this project, personally, it was really hard as a team for us to narrow the scope because Felicity had a lot of great project ideas, um, but we, and we also were all software-oriented, so it was hard to learn about the hardware. Designing AT is really difficult um, because you have to customize and we, it's hard to scale something that you're customizing. But working with Felicity was amazing. She was a really fantastic and understanding client and we really learned a lot through the process. Okay, thank you. Um, so your, your presentation was actually looked like a lot about exploring what products, right? Um, I wonder if you could say more about uh, what you learned about uh, what you were seeing with me. Some of this came out at the end of the So a few use cases. So we thought about this idea like early on actually in the semester, but we went we moved we moved away from it. But some use cases that Felicity had initially mentioned was like during class, um, she takes some classes and it's really hard for her to know when someone has told her it's her turn to speak. And so this was one use case there. And also when she's with friends and she's at a concert or something, and if she gets lost from her friends, this would be an easy way. She doesn't always carry her phone on her person, and so if they text her, she doesn't always know, or if they're calling her. And so this would be a quick way to to grab their attention. Um, one reason why we moved away was we thought about like security and like when we, if she went to a coffee shop and she wanted them to use it, how comfortable would people feel when someone's just walking up to them with this random remote, asking them to press a button to ask for her attention. Um, so that's why we felt like socially it'd be a really awkward device and so we moved away from it. Did you ever actually try that? Like go to a coffee shop and Yeah. Well, so we did it with, we were just filming and we, want, we asked them if we could like, just videotape our conversation like while she was ordering something and they're already really uncomfortable and so well it wasn't a, oh sorry um so she actually told us that she was uncomfortable with giving this device to someone else um i think part of one discussion we had was that she she didn't want to have to explain to someone else like why she's giving it to them because she already has like trouble like hearing them and communicating with them Otherwise, she wants like every piece of information told right away so that she doesn't have to answer questions. <laughs> and she was worried about the questions that she would have to answer if she gives someone this device. Yeah. And I guess the way we mediated that was in the end, the use cases we have for her and the ones that she wants is like to use this with friends and people she's already familiar with. Uh, well, just quickly, uh, was, there, was there any kind of prefabricated circuit that we could have used. I mean, I love the fact that you were able to, you know, you were very instructive building the building the circuit, but, you know, I hear so much about the you know, the process and the other, that would have been something that uh, could have served the purpose. Yeah, so the receiver itself is pre-bought, so that's something we used out of the box. Um, I think our functionalities are a bit more unsophisticated that we didn't have to turn towards Arduino's and more expensive things. Um, the biggest, like the bulkiest thing is a battery, and that was just something we decided to use because it was easily replaced. Okay, I think um, uh, with your team, I, th I think over the course of the semester, you've gotten to know Felicity better. I, you know, interested in seeing what the results are uh, in evaluating with them and. Uh, uh, I think you've done uh, some strong work putting together this prototype. Well done. All right. Thanks. <laughs>
Now, because you have limited mobility, you can't just move that drawer back up. And because you aren't able to yell for help, you're pretty much helpless. My name is Beth, this is Tanya and Laura, and this semester we had the pleasure of working with Margaret, our client. She found herself in this very situation, and because of that, she wanted to have a better way that she could call for help. She lives in the Boston Home, which is an assistive living community for about 90 residents in Dorchester, and she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, so she is bound to a wheelchair, as is all of the residents of the home. And I like, like I said, the goal of our project is to design a system that allows her to call for help. Currently, the system in place in the Boston home is just inaccessible for a large percentage of the time. Currently, it's a button that's attached to the wall, and when you're pulling the drawer open, the button's nowhere to be found. So what we did was develop an iPad app, we call it InstaAid, and it allows Margaret and many other residents to call for help. So we frequently visited the Boston home throughout the course of the semester to speak with both Margaret and other staff members at the home so that we could receive feedback as we iterated through several prototypes. Um, what you see here is an iPad screenshot of our first prototype. Before we got to this stage, we did do some paper prototype sketches as well and then um, implemented that on the iPad. And in our first iteration, our home screen was two large buttons for urgent and non-urgent requests. Pressing the urgent button um, results in a video chat with, uh, with a nurse at the um, nurse's station, and then pressing the non-urgent button leads you to um, the screenshot you see in the middle with six cookie cutter um, requests that residents commonly have, such as, please give me water. And pressing any of these buttons also um, leads the resident to a video chat with the nurse to specify more information about the request. Some feedback we received from this iteration was that we should replace the col colorful icons that we previously, previously had with larger and um, more contrast icons so that it's easier for residents to distinguish. And we were also um, advised to remove the urgent and non-urgent distinction for requests because each resident at the Boston home might have different views of what urgent means to them. And finally, we, um, after pressing one of the one of the buttons for common requests, we, and rather than being taken to a video chat, we showed the resident um, a screen that gave them information about whether their request has been received by the nurse and whether it's currently being addressed. So with this in mind, we moved on to our second iteration. So you can see the difference in icons that we have here with, with the black and white, the higher contrast. And um, so we now have um, video chat and send, and send message as two special um, icons that we hadn't implemented yet. But then the other four buttons lead to the request sent um, screen that you see on the right hand side. And it also gives the option to close the request. And we also um, made a prototype for the nurse in this iteration. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side that the nurse currently has two outstanding requests. Um, and then if she presses the process request button, uh, it turns to green. And then she can um, close it once it's completely fulfilled. Um, some feedback from this iteration is that we should introduce um, a login system so that um, that persists even when the app closes, so that residents don't need to log in every time they open the app. And at this point, we still need to implement um, sending custom text messages to the nurse and the video chat. So before we went on to test our final prototype and um, go on to actually deploy this at the Boston home, we decided to conduct a couple of experiments uh, so that we knew what we were dealing with. So the first thing we asked Margaret was how often she was unable to access the call light system when she, was, um, when she needed aid. And she responded that it was about 90% of the time. Um, and we also timed the amount of time that it took for a nurse to respond to her um, request by pressing the call light button. Um, and that ended up being approximately eight minutes every time she did that. Um, and finally, because we're using this iPad application and it depended on her being able to send this request to the nurse's station, uh, we wanted to make sure that the Wi-Fi network was robust enough to handle this. Um, and we found that it was 
pretty adequate that it covered most of the Boston home, but there were a couple of dead zones um, and transitions might have been an issue if she was moving while she was doing this. So taking this all into account, we um, made our final prototype and were able to um, give this to Margaret at the Boston home. So I'll just walk you through a workflow of potentially what a resident might do. So they are led to this home screen with the high contrast buttons and can press something like bring water, in which case they're gone to the request sent button. Um, that request is then sent to the nurse's side. It'll appear and they can go ahead and say that they want to process the request, that they've received it. Um, and then that'll show up on the uh, resident side saying request process. They can go ahead and close the request if they want. The nurse can also um, go ahead and close the request on their side as well once it's been fulfilled. Um, residents can also send a text message. So it's a custom message that they can send if they don't have any of the preset ones. So I need to take my medications um, and they can tell the nurse that they want that. And that will show up as a custom message on the nurse's side as well. And it proceeds from there. Um, so this wasn't shown in the screencast, but uh, there's also a video chat capability. So this is us testing it with Margaret. Um, she can simply press the button and then it connects directly with the iPad so she's able to do that. And what was great was when we left it at the uh, Boston home for a week, Dawn actually was kind enough to make this um, nurse's iPad mount. So as you can see, it's at the nurse's station with um, a bunch of the other devices there. So the nurse typically needs a computer, uh, the call light system itself, as well as a desk space for paperwork. So we put it right in the center of the desk so that they'll be able to see it. And it's always going to be on. It's never going to turn off. Um, and so that's just like a closer up version of that. So after this, we went back, visited our experiments, and tried to see what the results of our week-long test were. Um, and we found that Margaret was successfully able to send the request via her iPad and then receive aid from the nurse uh, when she requested something. So um, the iPad was actually only inaccessible one time. But during that one time, the call light was also inaccessible. So um, she had to find a different way to request aid. And we also found that the response time was faster. It was about three minutes. Um, and we're not completely sure about how that's going to work logistically because we believe that this might be a faster response time because it's a new system um, but we kind of want to see how it pans out uh, in the long run and we also found that there were no problems with Wi-Fi connectivity so from the very beginning Margaret's vision was for her to not just be the only client for the entirety of the Boston home to be the client so in this current week we've actually been working to deploy the system on more residents iPads and we've already received feedback and we're hoping to incorporate that. Um, we've also received the piece of feedback that it would be very helpful to have the location of the resident when they send the request. And that's something that we would propose as a future project. So ultimately, through working on this project, we want to reiterate that when you design for one client, that doesn't necessarily scale for all. We learned this. Uh, we also learned that uh, it's very helpful to receive feedback from many, many individuals, not just your direct clients. So we worked with a lot of the individuals in the Boston home. And finally, it was difficult for us to scope this project initially because there is so much potential, but we wanted to l deliver a product that was very useful in the con time constraints of this class. Ultimately, we'd really like to thank our client, Margaret uh, Don Fredette, who many of you have worked with, we really appreciate his help on our project and all of the Boston Home staff who's been really great at giving us feedback. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just wondering what the variables that you find really difficult to work with were things that were sort of out of control that you know, in an ideal world you know, Um, I think one of the main things was definitely like working with the nurses. Um, so we had started out with um, 
of course, talking to Margaret. And then we found that as much as we need to talk to Margaret, we also need to talk to the nurse uh, to get her input on the UI and so on and make sure that she's comfortable with using this system at her desk. Um, but one, it was kind of hard for her for us to meet with her because every time she was there, she was always busy addressing other residents' requests. Um, and secondly, she actually ended up leaving halfway through the semester. So the feedback that we had gotten from her um, was not necessarily put it over to the next person who's going to be there. Um, so working with that and making sure that whatever was going to be used from the nurse's side would actually be used, um, even though the residents would be comfortable with the system, it's not necessarily certain that the nurse would be able to do that. So um, that was a bit of a hardship. Um, I wonder how much you had, you had a slide about experiments and you had a slide with uh, sort of results <coughs> the prototype. How much data was behind each of those slides? So when you're measuring eight minutes of the response time, how many trials was that when you were measuring uh, her success with the system over the course of the week? How many requests did she actually So that's a very good question, and I'm we're going to answer honestly. Not enough for a very good metric. Um, so honestly, we spent an hour with her. We did it maybe five times, and that was kind of the average. However, to have a really good metric, we would five times using the old system, and and five times using the new system, okay. um, to have some kind of a comparison. But uh, of course, it's variable throughout the course of the week, and there are many different uh, variables that would change that time. So a more rigorous amount of metrics. We could write scripts for our current system to figure out when is, how much time is elapsing between when the request is sent and when it's processed. And that's something that we would propose to do with for future work. She, she had it for a week, but it wasn't actually logging the usage. We haven't analyzed the logging. Of, we haven't logged it, and we haven't analyzed it either. While uh, Team Beverly Ann gets set up, I think it's impressive that what you've done to build this end-to-end -end system. Can I ask a question? It was pretty early on in the semester that you chose to go with an all-software solution as opposed to plugging in some kind of wireless button into the wall um, as you know, uh, one might imagine you might uh, go, uh, you, might, you might imagine you might go in that direction. Can you reflect a little bit on, on that? Do you think ultimately it was the right decision? Or you know, when you made that decision, did you know what you were uh, going down? Sure. Um, so all of us are software people, so that was um, partial, partially um, an initial reason for why we wanted to go down this route. But another reason um, was just that we had a lot of great ideas for features that we wanted to see in this app that wouldn't be possible if we had chosen to interface with the existing system. For example, this video chat, the concept of sending custom messages, maybe even um, being able to receive feedback about um, how far along in the process the request is in terms of being addressed. So um, so all of us are really happy with the way it turned out. Um, Margaret was excited about the concept of video chatting and um, other residents that we've tested this out on were also happy with the ability to send custom um, text messages too. So we think it worked out well. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> nice. You got Team Beverly Ann to set up. Okay. Hi, everyone. We're Team Beverly Ann. I'm Vinny. I'm Shruthi. I'm Robert. And this is our final presentation. Our, client, our client's name is Beverly Ann, so she has a wide variety of interests. She, she's a social worker for the Department of Children and Families. She's learning how to code using Scratch and an and Arduino in her spare time. She loves Wii Tennis. She has a backyard garden, and her main goal is to maintain an active mind. And she's also been diagnosed for 11 years with charcot marie tooth which is a neurodegenerative disease that affects the extremities. So um, everyone's experience with CMT is different. And in the case of Beverly Ann, it mainly manifests in sensory failure and muscular failure in her hands. Um, so if you can see the diagrams over there, on the left hand, um, the blue areas are completely functional, but the green areas um, are experiencing muscular failure and they tend to curl in so they don't open and thus they're very useless to her. On her right hand, um, the sort of gray areas are areas where she can feel really well, um, but the red areas are areas where she cannot, she feels numbness. And so um, she has trouble gripping things as a result because she loses, she loses feeling in that hand. 
Um, and so as a result, she has to really consciously think about actions she performs. And this includes like picking up and holding on to objects, um, typing, and walking down stairwells with railings. Um, and you'll see in the next uh, few slides, we chose to focus on the problem with her right hand. So the assistive technology challenge over here is that uh, because that Beverly Ann is so worried that she's uh, going to drop something whenever she's grabbing it, uh, she becomes less confident in grabbing objects with just one hand. Uh, and here we are trying to reinstall her confidence in grabbing objects uh, with her uh, right hand by notifying her uh, whenever her grip is becoming loose. And uh, to design our product, we put them into three stages of uh, prototypes. And so as we, uh, as Huthi talked about before, we uh, focus on the problem with her right hand because she normally uses her right hand to grab objects. And we, uh, very early on, we decided that we want to quantify her grip pressure and uh, notify her when, whenever her grip is becoming loose. Uh, so this is, um, so these are the uh, early stage brainstorming ideas we had. Um, and we were focusing on exploring different choices of where to put the uh, pressure sensors as well as the uh, circuit boards. So uh, the left part shows that we're putting the pressure sensor um, on the upper palm, and whereas the uh, right part show, showing another idea of putting the pressure sensor on her fingertips. And then later on, we, uh, we followed the uh, second idea. So this is our uh, prototype stage one, and it's a low fidelity non-functional prototype. Um, and we uh, were exploring uh, multiple designs for this look like prototype uh, by asking uh, Beverly Ann to try out different versions and then see which one feels the most comfortable. And uh, these uh, upper part are the pictures that uh, for the minimalistic design for, um, for the uh, gloves. Um, yeah, that's the stage one prototype. For the stage two prototype, we were mostly interested in making a functional design. So basically fulfilling her goal of being able to notify her when she's gripping something and it's slipping. So we made a, we constructed a circuit on a breadboard and we hooked it up to an Arduino. And then we coded, we, we uploaded code to the Arduino that would cause a vibration motor to vibrate whenever um, the sensors that are also hooked up to the circuit sense that your gripping object and then it's released past a certain threshold. And we actually tested this with Beverly Ann and she really liked how loud the vibration motor was and how strong it was. And she mentioned that it actually helped her consciously remember like, oh, I need to re-grip and grip stronger. And she actually also really liked the material of the glove that we used. And she asked us not to actually not to cut it like how we did for her first prototype. And it was also pretty easy to grip with the material we were using. And mostly we use this prototype to test the range of sensor values that output when she grabbed different types of objects. So for example, like a cup or a mug or utensils, and they actually turned out to be in a round of a similar range. So um, the main problem with the previous prototype was that it wasn't portable because we had to plug it into the computer. So the final prototype, which is actually on my arm right now, is both functional and portable. So the idea is that um, we printed a circuit board to do what our breadboard was originally doing, but that breadboard was way too heavy. Um, so we got one custom made. Um, and that's here. And then on the back, we have an Arduino lily pad, which is a lighter version of an Arduino. Um, and it provides like the code and the power supply to the circuit. Um, we have sensors attached to the gloves. And then we have an armband. We discussed with her a lot how she wanted to carry this device around. And her main constraint was that like she wanted it to be light, um, but like not on her upper arm or too close to her wrist, somewhere where it would be stable. And so we chose to make an armband uh, right around here um, so that it would be portable. And the vibration motor is sewn into the armband so that if I were to turn the switch on to start it so that we don't waste battery life and uh, squeeze it and then let go, I can feel the vibration, even though you can't hear it so that it's not disruptive to other people around. Um, and the other thing that we made sure to do was that our power supply is pretty light. It's only one AAA battery. And because it's like a standard AAA battery, she can replace it whenever it goes out of battery. So we don't have to worry about um, prolonging its lifespan. 
Uh, so for experimentation, we mostly did with our stage two prototype when we met up with uh, Beverly Ann. So we focused on two things. The first thing is tether, uh, test whether the prototype is working as we expected in terms of notifying Beverly Ann whenever her uh, grip pressure becomes loose. Uh, and uh, also to see whether it actually decreases the uh, time when she uh, drops the objects. Um, and also the second thing we focused on is to compare two cases. Uh, one is when she wears a glove and then when uh, the other case is when she does not wear the glove uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, when, when she grips different types of objects, including a uh, cup, phone, plate, and a fork, and uh, record uh, different um, holding times for uh, these, uh, in the case when she gr grabs various objects um, uh, in both when she wears the glove and uh, when she does not wear the glove. Um, so we took a lot of data in the beginning, especially when we had to make our second prototype to figure out um, how to sort of adjust the code so that it would work for her range of however she would grip. And so if you can see here, this is like an example of the kind of data we had to get. A lot of it is just voltage readings, but it's like the key voltage uh, values here are like what voltage do we see when she drops when she or she's about to drop the object that she's holding and like what finger are we reading this value from and so based on that we were able to like figure out how to tune the code to accommodate for all of her fingers um, we were also able to get time so the time in the very last column is approximately how long she ha is holding it before she either unconsciously slips it or needs to put it down um, and we actually saw like just between not having a prototype versus having that second prototype a noticeable increase in the amount of time uh, by about like 50%. Um, unfortunately, since our prototype only recently became portable, we weren't able to give it to her for a long period of time. And um, so we'd like to measure her drop rate over about a week and then see after she's gotten accustomed to the device whether the time it takes for her to drop it is longer now instead of uh, what it was before. And that's what we'll be doing over the next few weeks. Here are a couple of reflections that we had on the design process. So one thing especially is that simplicity is key. I know this was something very emphasized in the class and that's very true. Um, another thing is that in order to design something that your client can use in real life, you need to, it's very important to have multiple prototypes and to be able to deal with any technical difficulties that you have that come up with the process. And of course, you always have to listen to who you're working with because you're a partner in a team. You're not, you know, it's not a customer um, company sort of relationship. And some reflections on 6811 PPAT. Um, we were all really glad we took the class. Um, we kind of wish we had other ways to educate ourselves through about disabilities beforehand, but we're really glad this class gave us the opportunity to explore that. And I'm just gonna leave you guys with this one quote. If there's one thing that PPAD has taught me, it's that a disability isn't a good enough reason to stop doing anything. Thanks, and we'll take questions. Um, so in terms of actually being able to slip it on, we found that that's relatively easy. And in terms of body placement, we checked with her to make sure that was okay. Um, the wires are honestly our biggest problem right now because they um, stick out. And if they get caught onto something that could be really dangerous and could rip apart the circuitry. So um, along with like giving her the prototype to see how it works for her um, out in the field for like the next few weeks, we're also going to uh, talk about how to cover all of this circuitry so that it doesn't stick out. And we're planning, we have like cloth and um, other materials ready to like start sort of making this more compact. Can you tell about using conductive So we did. Um, the only issue was that um, the board that we um, were using required um, some components that would require wires anyways. 
And so as a result, and plus like actually connecting to the glove would have definitely required wires because there's there's like a gap in cloth here that she wanted to like have like a watch or a, like bangles and such. So um, we needed to use wires anyway. So we figured that we might as well um, go the whole way with wires. And this way we can modify stuff easier. <laughs> Yeah, sure. My last question is actually, so it seems that the, the big thing for her is that she needs to remember that she is trying to do something. And I wonder how much of that reminder is simply from wearing something on the head, which is kind of healthy, and so just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm wearing this, right? I'm like, trying to hold on something up. And then, does it really have to vibrate only when she's about to drop off? Is it vibrating itself? Um, so I'm not really sure because when we were talking to her and she was focusing on it, um, so when she had the glove, we ended up having to just ask her questions so her mind would be distracted off of. So I think if there's a continuous um, vibration, she might get habituated to it and like not recognize it as yeah. something that she has to respond that to. Was, that was our main concern, that like if we, if we just had some sort of static device, that she would get used to it and then start ignoring it. Um, but when we did the data analysis, we made sure that like as soon as her grip like starts to slip, and we worked on this really carefully with her, it would buzz immediately. And she, she really felt that like it notified her as soon as she was in any danger of dropping something. So she was like, this is much better than having some sort of consistent reminder. Um, also, I feel like it's not really about her, uh, like forgot about uh, like she's grabbing something. Like she knows she's grabbing something, but it's just gradually over time, she's not sure how much force she's exerting because she cannot feel her like finger. finger. So uh, because of that, she generally lose confidence in uh, grabbing things just because of the fear of uh, might, she might drop it. So it's really more about uh, telling her that you won't drop it and then just be confident with like, you know, uh, grabbing things. And then whenever you are about to drop it, we will notify you. So ha having that confidence really puts her back into a normal condition where giving her the capability of grabbing things with uh, like more hand, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rachel, this is Jessica, and this is Stephanie. We're Team Art, and we're here to talk to you about the vertical screw lift that we spent this semester designing and building. Um, first, we'd like you to meet Art, who's actually right over there. We were really happy he was able to come today. Um, he is an avid hacker, rock climber, and member of his community, which is the town of Bolerica, Massachusetts, where he lives with his girlfriend. Um, he's very active, gets himself around, is very independent, and wanted to be able to take advantage, or, or he works a lot with mechanical tools and he wanted to be able to get in and out of his wheelchair onto the floor. Um, he's in a chair because he has T5 A to B paraplegia and that means he has no motor function and limited sensory function below the legs, or below the waist, sorry. Um, he has a hacker space at the Artisans Asylum in Somerville and this is where we spent most of our time meeting with him. So, as I just said, our goal was to design a lift to help Art move up and down from the floor in multiple settings. So the idea was he would be able to use it at his home or at the Artisan's Asylum or maybe bring it into his car to take it wherever he might be going. Um, and we had a couple of design goals with this. We wanted a clearance height of four inches or less. Um, we wanted it to be able to lift Art in less than 45 seconds because existing devices like pool swings tend to be very slow and we wanted it to weigh less than 20 pounds, which is what his girlfriend is capable of lifting, but lift up to 300. Um, the bottom line though, really the most important thing in all of this was that we wanted our design to be portable and we wanted it to be safe to use. And with a mechanical device like this, this is surprisingly difficult to accomplish. So I wanted to walk you all through the sorts of designs we were considering um, while we were doing this. 
the first thing we talked about as a team was this scissor lift design, which is used quite frequently in industrial settings. It's what you might see on uh, one of those like cherry picker things that the telephone guy uses. Um, but they're very complicated pieces of machinery, actually, and the actuators and hinges are very expensive for them. So we decided this is not a good option. Next, we thought about a sort of like out there solution, uh, the idea of using a lifting cushion. But these, we realized after talking to Art, would present us with stability problems. If we wanted variable height, which we do, he might want to transfer to a 12 inch surface or an eight inch surface, or maybe to something higher than his chair even. If it was only partially inflated, transferring on and off of the cushions would be a huge problem. We so we started talking about using this tripod design, which would be very stable and had fewer parts than the scissor jack, we thought. Um, but the more we talked about it, uh, the more we realized that the pulley that we had designed, like right here, that pulls the seat up and down, wasn't going to provide a safety for Art when the motor was off. So the seat would be in danger of sliding up and down. And so we'd have to install some sort of manual brake or chain mechanism and we thought long and hard about how to implement this and decided we weren't sure how to do it, so we needed another idea. And those of you who were able to join us last time will remember that we brought in this cute little prototype about this big that had a screw built into it, which basically you turn the screw and the seat goes up or the seat goes down. And the thing that's really wonderful about this is that even when the motor's off, the seat doesn't move uh, vertically at all. It's quite stationary. I mean, like, it's very stationary, even on our big design, right? <laughs> um, so, we can go to the next slide. All right, so we will be showing you our products and our functions. So currently what Rachel is doing is connecting the um, 24 volt, a few 24 volt batteries through Anderson plugs to our motor, which was provided by Don Fidette of the Boston Home. It's been incredibly useful. So as you can see, because of that, that's a bi-directional, uh, because that's a bi-directional switch, we have the capability of having the motors turn in different directions. So we can essentially move the seat. Yes, thanks. <laughs> so this is, this is it. Yep, um, as you can see, it functions perfectly fine. So how, how what exactly is this? contraption made of? Well, the frame is actually made of a bunch of 80-20 aluminum rods that we actually scrounged from an abandoned laser in the physics lab. So this, the entire frame would probably cost 200 to maybe $400 if we purchased it directly from the 80-20 site, so we got really lucky there. Um, the lifting mechanism is actually, it's, it's essentially a an acme rod that we, a threaded acme rod that we purchased ourselves. Um, and this is the life-size version of the tiny screw that you guys saw in the previous balsa wood uh, tiny model. Um, and we were able to obtain that motor that's turning the acme rod as, um, and these batteries from, again, Don Fredette from the Boston home. Uh, the seat is made of aluminum and it was actually water jetted by someone from the course three department. Um, it's, weighs approximately eight to 10 pounds, so it bears a decent bulk of the weight. Um, and the, there's a lot of connective hardware in our, in our device. Um, to actually interface the motor with the Acme rod, we had to purchase a few sprockets um, in order, and a chain in order to actually have the motor actuate um, the spinning motion of the, of the rod itself. And we had to purchase several flanges, um, flange bearings and thrust bearings in order to reduce friction between the Acme rod and the 8020 frame itself, um, as well as actually connect the Acme rod to the seat. So as Rachel mentioned before, our, design our desired features involve moving, art, preferably moving art um, up and down about 20, to 22 to 24 inches in less than 40, uh, 45 seconds. We would like a clearance distance of four inches and we wanted the device to weigh less than 20 pounds. The, currently our device lifts and lowers um, a complete length in approximately 30 seconds. So we definitely met the first feature. Um, we also met the second feature in the sense that we have a clearance distance of four inches. 
Um, unfortunately, we were unable to make this apparatus weigh less than 15 pounds because it weighs 30 pounds, and that can be attributed to the really, <laughs> really heavy aluminum frames. Um, and currently, it actually does not lift weight because the motor is, it does not provide an, enough torque to actually lift a significant am amount of weight. So we got pretty close with this design, but there are still a few improvements that we would have liked to make. First and foremost, we need a higher torque motor. Our current motor does not have enough torque to actually lift weight, and that's the primary function of our device, so we can't perform that, it's a problem. Uh, we would also like to reduce the weight of this contraption because it is a little heavier than we like. So lighter and thinner parts would be optimal. Another issue is portability. That was one of our original design goals and we haven't quite gotten there yet. Our current idea would be to add wheels to the back end of it and a handle so that you could tilt and pull back. And safety, the device is pretty safe except for the loose chain that's open here, so we would like to be able to cover that. And some of the things that we've learned through this project are that parts are expensive. You know, software is not so expensive, parts are expensive. Um, understanding and designing for your user is very important. Um, but you also have to keep in mind safety and feasibility, and it's, it can be pretty complicated. Iteration, therefore, is key. That is one of the most important things you can do. And sadly, with our limited time frame and our large device, it was hard to iterate as much as we wanted. Like I said, the most valuable resource there, of course, would be time. Since we didn't have enough time to iterate as much as we'd liked, you know, reaching out to others for assistance. That's super important. We received a lot of help from art from the Department of Materials Science. And, you know, we received a lot of help from Dawn, who gave us a lot of parts and who helped us connect all of this together, and from the PPAT staff in general. And so with that, we'd like to thank you guys and open the floor to questions. Um, so it's definitely uh, based on <laughs> Rachel actually just standing on the apparatus and jumping on it. It's definitely stable in terms of actually holding up weight, but the issue is... I should add that this is a new development. Yeah. It was not, that was not true until Sunday when Art helped us with Shane apart to keep the seat stable. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had all of this working except the seat was wobbly for the longest time and we were really concerned about this as a design feature, obviously. Um, we actually didn't get to the point of <laughs> Ideally, though, it, there should be no issue with um, with our transferring into on, out of the chair because this would be positioned right next to his wheelchair, so that he would have to do a slide over onto the chair at once it's set at the ideal height. Uh, but if you're on the floor, if you're on the floor, then. Yeah. yeah, and this that's the, so the clearance of four inches was a design goal given by Art. Uh, four inches is the maximum distance that he's comfortably able to move vertically to a different surface. Injury, and so we were trying to account for that with the design set. So the uh, design goals for the frame is set parallel to the chair, and then you lift, you, you come up to a seat height, and then you would start to the seat Other questions? Sure. What do you think are the trade-offs of making it lighter and the safety construction? Right? Like if it's lighter, like would it be easier to tip over? Like have you guys thought about what happens if So I guess I should talk into the microphone, but um, 
Basically, no, because the center of mass of this th contraption is always going to be over the center of the frame, and with a user on it or like transferring onto it, there's always going to be weight over the like support base. Um, in terms of making it lighter, we wouldn't be looking probably to replace the entire frame. We might make it out of like a smaller 8020 if like that was a possibility. But the biggest thing we could do to reduce weight is to reduce the thickness of the seat. Half inch aluminum holds up like a thousand pounds and that's just unnecessary. It's just happened to have what we had lying around. Um, it was what we didn't have to pay for. Um, and if we had a lot of time, we would probably go and mill out some, uh, some shapes in the bottom to like optimize thickness where it was necessary and cut out extra weight where it wasn't. Um, the other reason part the, that it's heavy in general is just that we ended up finding that lighter components, like components that weren't made for heavy duty usage, weren't gonna stand up to the wear and tear. We expected this device to see. Um, we actually had a like second prototype that never made it in here because it was like terrible. We bought like cheap components and they were lighter components and they just didn't work um, at the, rotations, I mean, that, spe that rod right now is turning at 400 RPM, and so it has to go, be able to spin really smoothly and without bending, and so any material that's not tool grade steel doesn't work, and et cetera, et cetera. All right, we need to try to reach a new bottom. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have team Paul to set up. Okay, so we're Team Paul, my name is Yi, and uh, I'm Lexi, and I'm Brady, and we are designing a coffee crane, which we'll let you know. <laughs> so first, just want to quickly review, so our client is Paul, he has been an MPD for over 30 years, so he uses um, these forearm crutches to help him, and then because he had an injury, I guess, with his um, hip, for so that he's been kind of regaining his strength and then he's doing physical therapy now so he's mostly staying home so our client's not going to be um, around so we're designing this for the home so the problem statement is we want to design a device or a mechanism that allows Paul to carry at least one full cup of coffee around his house without spilling or without gripping onto the cup like this so which is how he carries it um, before and the success metrics that we had was current status, well, I guess the previous status, is that coffee cup can only be filled to one third full. So in the morning, he can only fill up to one third, walk to the sofa, and then sit down and then drink the one third cup of coffee, and then go back to get more. And then he had to clog grip on the cup. So because he's using crutches that sometimes can be turbulent, so even if it's only one third full, it can still spill on his hand. And so when we we're coming out with goals. We had two goals, like the livable goals and the ambitious goal. So we want to design something that doesn't spill when it's too thirdful, and there's no need to hold on to the cup like he does now where it's clawing. And then hopefully it can be removable with 20 seconds on and off time. And then Paul gives a rating of six out of 10, <coughs> and it works for one of his mugs. That, Cause that's one of the main thing Paul wants is like he wants to use his mugs instead of like uh, maybe a thermal or something. And then the ambitious goal is to no spill with coffee cups three fourth full and then no need to hold it again and then removable within 10 seconds and then Paul raised it eight out of 10 and then it works for all of his mugs. And then just some of our early prototypes. So we were thinking of maybe we, if we just cover the cup with one of these, which works really well, like it will not spill. And then just maybe put it in like one of the stage holder and then just put the stage holder on his crutches. And because his mug didn't fit in that, that's too small and we were thinking Another kind of cover, which is the flexi cover. So it takes a, actually a lot of strength to put on and you have to like stretch it. And then we were thinking, well, maybe we can use some sort of um, gyroscopic cup holder idea, which allows it to swing. And then this works horrible. <laughs> and um, there's filling even when you put the cup in. And then we're thinking this kind of clamp to clamp onto his crutches, which we have here. And um, uh, Paul actually destroyed it because it's too weak. <laughs> he like broke this thing when we tested it. And then after all this iteration and looking for the right products, we have a final, pro final prototype. So our final prototype, one of the, one of the main things that we, um, products that we found was the uh, spill knot. And basically it's a product that 
if you put a coffee mug on it, um, you can put it at any angle basically, and it won't spill the contents. Um, and this has to do with like the forces as you move this way, like counteract the other forces. So um, <laughs> magic. Um, <laughs> Uh, but basically this uh, definitely, it works with basically any mug that you could put in here and it definitely works with all of Paul's mugs and probably any he would get in the future. And it definitely is no spill. Uh, the only time it would spill is if it hits something um, or like gets jarred in any way. So uh, we decided to put it on a rod like far away from his crutch so it wouldn't actually hit into his crutch. Uh, and basically just put a hook on the end so that he could easily connect it onto the um, onto the rod and then it would be easy to just slip on and off. Uh, and we needed a stronger clamp, obviously. This is not actually the one we ended up using. I don't have a picture of it. We got uh, clamps from Don Fredette and um, it was, uh, basically, it's a clamp that he would leave on there permanently, and he's really okay with that. He actually really likes that it's there, and it's very solidly on his um, crutch. And then he can just uh, attach this rod to um, the clamp then. And then we added this handle on it uh, for, to make it even easier to put on. Um, and this is the product on Paul's uh, crutch. It doesn't have the handle on it yet. Uh, this picture is taken before we put it on. And um, so some of the assumptions that we made while m making this final prototype was that uh, when he's putting the spill knot on and off, he would be able to like remain standing and he wouldn't spill anything. And that mainly, uh, basically, he would be able to move around his apartment and maneuver in there. Uh, and so when we went to experiment with this, we actually uh, were using the weaker clamp at the time, so we basically couldn't uh, test with the coffee cup in it, but we were able to test uh, basically different rod lengths. Um, so there's eight inch, and then we also tested a 12 inch, and then we tested um, where he was able to hold it out this way with his crutch, and then this way, and then this way, basically. Um, and we found that straight ahead was the best orientation um, because it didn't knock into the wall and all the other ones did with the eight inch. Um, so this is a video of Paul putting the clamp on. And um, as you can see, it doesn't take very much time because the clamp or the clamp is already on there and he's just putting the rod on. And then he puts the spill nut on top of it and he can maneuver with it um, and it's just kind of hanging out there. Uh, <laughs> and um, he's able to maneuver, that's his cat. Um, he's able to maneuver around his apartment fairly easily. And yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. So uh, as you can see from our success metrics, uh, we had Paul test out the prototype, left it with him for a week, uh, asked for his feedback, and he gave us very, very enthusiastic feedback. He loves it, he rates it 10 out of 10. Uh, it was actually really nice to see when we walked in the door, uh, when we met with him, that he had the clamp still on uh, from when we'd given it to him last week. He said he hadn't taken it off. So uh, that was really nice. Um, and he said he's been walking around his apartment with full cups of coffee. He hasn't spilled anything yet. Uh, so he was really, really happy about that. Um, obviously, he doesn't need to hold the coffee cup because it's out on the spill knot. So that was another one of our ambitious goals that we met. Uh, the one part that we didn't quite meet is it does take a little bit longer to uh, put on and take off because it is uh, that rotating motion, uh, putting on and taking off the extension as opposed to, say, a quick release clamp or something like that. But that was a trade-off we were willing to make because uh, it's definitely more sturdy. Like we said, he destroyed our other clamp because he's got really, really good grip strength. Um, anyway, and so it, and like we said, it, it works for all of Paul's mugs. So that part's fantastic. All right, so what did we learn through all of this? Uh, nothing is as simple as it first appears. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, 
you kind of underestimate the task when you think, oh, I just need to have him walk around his apartment with a full cup of coffee. How hard can that possibly be? But it turns out, you know, that was actually really, really difficult. And if it hadn't been for the spill knot, we probably wouldn't have been able to accomplish the goal uh, that we had set for ourselves. But that spill knot was definitely a lifesaver. Um, fail fast and iterate until success. Like we said, you know, the, the covers probably would have worked okay, but they're really hard to put on and take off. So from then that kind of sparked the rest of our ideas. Um, and then with the spill knot, you know, we thought maybe he could just hang it off the, the handle of his crutch, but you know, that doesn't really occur to you. Well, what happens if it bumps into his crutch and all of a sudden it starts spilling everywhere? So fail fast and iterate from there. And finally keep the end user involved. Uh, Paul, met with us pretty much every week. He was always available and it, we definitely came up with something in the end that he's very, very happy with. So, um, and from Paul, we learned to be grateful for the small things such as being able to carry a full cup of coffee. And his favorite quote and this, the thing that he said literally every time we visited was, you guys are doing wonderful stuff. This is great. So keep it up. <laughs> All right, that's it. <laughs> Yes. So what you ended up with still has like three parts to it, right? There's yes. Tour and there's the spill knot and the coffee. Yep. Um, did your explorer trying to cut that down to two? I mean, it, certainly you need the coffee to be able to. Uh, but uh, there is no you can't really attach the bottom of the You mean the, uh, as in like from here and eliminate the hook portion? Um, well, so it would. If when you're spinning it on, it would kind of, I mean, you could do it, but uh, I think that it was a little bit hectic. If you wanted to spin it on, it would kind of like flip the spill knot around. Well, plus the other part is when, how Paul uses it is once he's out of the kitchen and into his living room, the table is actually at just the right height where he can remain standing and gently set the spill knot onto the table and unhook it from his crutch. So then he doesn't run the risk of uh, you know, he, he would he would have to remain standing and like try and unscrew it with the cup still on the spill knot. So it helps with it helps with the delivery time onto the exactly. The other part of that would be that if you could attach the clamp to the rod, what was that difficult for him? So he he was he yeah the the clamp finding the clamp finding a clamp that worked really well and then. Uh, Finding the correct length rod to keep it out away from the crutch was kind of a, an iterative process. Like we said, we tried out the 12 inch, we tried out the eight inch. Um, and the other thing is he, he really liked the idea of keeping it on there permanently, at least the clamp. Um, and if there would have been a, a quick release clamp that worked very well, we probably would have looked into that a little bit further. Uh, but the clamp that he liked the best and that definitely worked the best is the one that was on there permanently. So it made more sense to just be able to unscrew the, the rod so. Could I suggest that maybe you look into getting him a crutch that you attach this to that he only uses in the house? So Paul's crutches are actually custom and are. Super expensive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, what did the, what the previous group mentioned, like 200 to $400 for aluminum, we'd be at easily double that max price. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What? It's called any time you said that you say, oh, adaptable equipment. You nick, you drop nick, your cars yeah. and bend over because it's something you really don't like. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could get t shirts with that fail fast, iterate until success. <laughs> <laughs> the All MIT right. motto, right? <laughs> All right. Time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi guys, I'm Kelly. I'm Eddie. I'm Eunice. Um, we're here to talk to you guys about Script Speak. Um, so our client this semester was Barbara, uh, who was a former teacher who now lives at the Leonard Florence Center. Uh, Barbara, over a year ago, found out that she was diagnosed with primary lateral sclerosis, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disease, um, which results in muscle weakness. Uh, as a result, speaking for her now is very hard, and her speaking has gotten more unclear as time has progressed. Um, because of her speech, uh, she's faced several challenges uh, in different sorts of environments. Uh, when it comes to group environments, it can be very hard for people to understand her, be it like because often they're very, very noisy. Um, she also has trouble speaking to people who don't understand how her speech 
functions, um, such as non-native English speakers um, or taxi drivers, uh, people who just don't have correspondence with her. She's also found that in virtual environments, it's also very difficult for her to talk to people, so through phone or video chats. Um, currently, she's tried out two solutions besides speaking, um, and one of them was called Prolog for Text. Uh, this is a um, assistive voice, sorry, assistive tech, text to um, voice uh, app, and she found it very unintuitive to use because technology is not her forte. Um, she also tried using something called a boogie board, which is a more physical uh, board that she can use instead. Um, and through this, she found that it was nice because she could write, um, but also kind of inconvenient because she would have to write out everything she wanted to say, and she couldn't save it anywhere. And so both these solutions were lacking something. Um, and knowing that she was technologically um, not very uh, equipped, um, we knew that our app had to be simple um, to fix her problem. And so we decided to create Script Speak. Uh, Script Speak is a text to voice app um, whose main purpose is to be as simple to use as possible, as well as customizable so the user can enter in any phrases they want. Um, and ultimately, it should expand the environment in which she can speak. All right, so our success metrics are here. Um, our livable goals is what I'll uh, mainly cover, which is we wanted her to be able to attempt to speak. Um, one of the main reasons is the you use it or use it or lose it, right? So she continues to try and like use her speech, but even over the course of this class, uh, we have seen a, a significant uh, decrease in her ability to pronounce certain syllables. So we want her to be able to try, but if it, she ends up not being able to speak, we want to be able to either type out the phrase or if she's already spoken that phrase, she can find it in her history or in her favorites within five clicks. We want to basically have her increase the efficiency of her speech uh, by lowering uh, her response time by about 20% overall. So basically an amortized cost over like how many times she reuses phrases as opposed to her current uh, method, which she has to type out every phrase uh, whenever she's going to speak it, so she can't really reuse or um, use the components that are available. Even though the features are there, it's just very complicated for her. Uh, and uh, larger, noisier environments uh, from five to 10 people. So right now, she's really f okay with like speaking to you and using her current apps uh, when it's one to one or one to like three, especially for our meetings. but. In other settings, she wasn't able to use her apps because the iPhone is too low and the iPad app she hadn't used for an extended period of time, so she was very uncomfortable using it. So we wanted to give her a solution she can use in both of those settings. Um, so we started prototyping with um, her, main, her main point being keep it simple, the simpler the better. So we started off, we gave her this uh, paper prototype where we had her test and right from the start we found out that we found that Every, uh, most of the common uh, UI functionality that we're all used to with uh, apps in the App Store don't really seem intuitive to her. So swiping to delete and a few other of these characteristics were not um, something she would use. So we stripped that down and we went back to like how UIs um, are more intuitive in terms of you see and you click on it and that's what you get. Um, so we see here the star for favoriting and so on. Then we created our second prototype really quickly because we wanted to get something in her hand with App Inventor. So we, ba we built basically an app that she could click the text and uh, it would like play and she can add text and store that into her history. So that was our initial prototype. Then we started having the iOS app. So we didn't want to have no interaction until um, too late. So we started off, we had her history page and her favorites page right from the start. But um, we needed to update a few things so we could have the stars uh, be on and off as she would like it. Uh, and then we connected both. So whatever she did on the history page was reflected on the favorites page if it was necessary. And then after we finished this, we brought it to her and we got a, feedback, we got a piece of feedback we didn't expect, which is that she wanted it to connect between her iPhone and her iPad. Initially, she, she said that her iPhone was too low. Uh, and the volume was too low, so she really couldn't use it in most environments. But then she told us that uh, if she's gonna if she's gonna be in a smaller setting, she's gonna have her phone with her because it's not like it's less heavy. 
So we needed to connect both of them. So we've just connected the apps through Parse and we're gonna deliver that to her. So the functionality is the same. It's just now whatever she types in in one will be reflected in the other. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll have a demo for you. Uh, now we're gonna show you guys a demo using the simulator. Um, however, the text-to-speech doesn't actually play on a laptop. So we will play it for you on our iPad. Um, but as you can see, we have the app working on both the phone and the iPad, so it's customizable for both. I'm trying to find your screen. Pull it that way. This way. It seems like the simulator cannot be dragged. Okay. It can't be dragged over. Yeah, it cannot be dragged over. Can you switch so it? We can. No, can you? S you can switch the. Or you mirror the display. Yeah. Oh. Mirror. The I don't remember how to do that. Uh, in any event, we do have. Um, Wait, you're in the yeah. oh, system preferences. <laughs> Sorry. So, in any event, we do have the app loaded onto uh, our iPad. So, we added the feature that she can uh, compose a sentence with um, previously. Um, set text and then she can play it in the end so she can store her name and whenever she has to type in her name it's always there for her. Uh, we also added that she can delete so she can delete her messages and she can go to her history and in her history she can favorite the items and then if she deletes these items this is awesome. so yeah she can play it um, a little plug in there and if she deletes these from her this is awesome. I'm sorry uh, if she deletes these from her favorites, it reflects in her history. And since we also deleted from the history, it no longer shows up. Um, we have another more intensive uh, technical thing. Sorry, I, the simulator is too big for that screen, so we we'll just have to go. So, um, yeah. So we'll just continue on. Fine, we'll just continue on. Uh, it'll be fine. I don't, I don't know how to use this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Where is Chrome now? <laughs> All right. Um, just hit. Present, present, present. So yeah, so uh, that's most of the functionality and now it's connected as well. Uh, and she's been using this for the past week, uh, past, uh, yeah, week and a half, so. Um, so we did a couple experiments with her to see how well our app were compared to all the other ways. So um, we asked her to say a short phrase first. So just to say, hi, my name is Barbara, four different ways. First by speaking and then writing on the boogie board and this group speak and then also her app prologue. As you can see, um, the second time, the blue is after she has, r the orange is when she writes the phrase the very first time, and then she saves it in the app, and then when she tries to, she gets, uh, she closes the app and then accesses it the second time, um, script speak is a lot faster. Um, the first time it takes a while because um, this was on her iPad, which is new, so the autocorrect wasn't trained enough with what she usually says. Um. Um, so another thing that we also measure was the number of clicks that we, it takes. Also for sp sp script speak, it takes a lot fewer clicks, um, as you can see here. And also for Prolog, the other app, it um, is very inconsistent and ver because it's very confusing for her. So um, even though she saved it, she couldn't find it, so she had to like end up typing it again, which is why it takes so many clicks. Um, this is a video of her using um, Prolog. Sorry, we don't have time for video. It's okay, just please. Uh, just yeah, just play it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, we can move on then. Yeah. Yeah, just so basically nice. in the video, you see that she uh, doesn't feel comfortable with Prolog, so we asked her to repeat the phrase, and she has to type out the entire phrase again because she doesn't know where it's stored, whereas in our application, she was able to go to the other screen and immediately just find it in her history, and then she favorited it after that, 
and she had it as well. So she was able to play it from the history page without any real time. It was like a, five, a three, four second time um, to reply, whereas the other sec was just as when she typed it. And then we have. And then we asked her repeat, to repeat the experiment, this time with a longer phrase. And as you can see, the second time it was a lot shorter. With prologue, it seems like the second time is also a lot shorter, but actually it didn't really work. So she clicked it and the phrase was entered into her um, text like multiple times and she was like very confused about it so actually <laughs> even though it was fast it didn't work well <coughs> and um, as for the number of clicks um, similarly it was like fewer clicks but it didn't work so that didn't accomplish the goal um, this is the amount of um, time she used it so we left the app with her over a weekend and she used um, this is the information we got from her iPad she used this phrase like twice three times so she was actually like using this app to speak and um, she also used it on her phone more but um, we couldn't get the data for that so um. Maybe Um, yeah, that was probably the hardest thing we had to deal with all semester because um, when we finally chose our idea to build software and develop an app, uh, we lost um, around a month's time, so we had to really cram it all in. But it basically made us realize that um, early on you got to learn how to fail fast, and so you can go with an idea, but only until you realize that it's like not possible or not, and you shouldn't just hold on to one thing because you think that that's the only idea that she wants. And so it's really important to always communicate with your client and throw out any ideas you have as well, because you're also part of the solution, and you have as much say in it as they do, and you can bounce ideas off each other and come up with something really awesome. Um, another part of that is that we, like, part of uh, what we have here in our lessons learned is uh, we came up with an idea of the script speak that we were never asked for uh, initially. She really didn't think of it as a possible solution. She wanted home automation, and we focused on that until we found out by regulations that we would have too long, too short of a time to actually make a difference. So we were able to, like, uh, make an idea and, like, converse with her about something that she didn't uh, particularly want and then the moment we get, came up with that idea she was like oh I love that do that like forget the door so it was it was a hard process but we ended up like liking the pro liking the project we had and we're all CS majors so it was definitely our home field advantage so was it something you just intuitively knew would help her or? um so she actually mentioned many times that she would like an app that would help her speak better because it's the most difficult problem she deals with she just didn't know that it was possible to create something that could fix it and so we realized that hey we're CS majors we can definitely do this for you and she was amazed to see that it was actually possible other questions or comments okay I think we're at time today thank you very much team Barbara all right well done today everybody uh, thanks for coming out three hours of presentations. We will have a class lecture next Wednesday at 1 o'clock, and then the showcase is uh, from 3 to 5 uh, next Wednesday. Thanks very much. All right.